My dear students in advanced macro, I want to tell you today about life cycle consumption. And I want to present you a model that supplies you with a micro foundation of how completely rational consumers who know their life cycle income allocate consumption across time. And the starting point for our thoughts is a utility function. And here I have a very special utility function for you. The utility U of consumption C in round T should be given by a constant 0 0.9 minus 0 0.6 times E to the power of minus CT over phi. Phi is just the Greek letter. It's a perimeter here. And we might denote the phi just by 100. Now this utility function has an attractive shape. And this shape can be denoted here in a diagram. So I'm putting the utility here on the y-axis. And I'm plotting consumption here. Now assume for a moment that consumption consumption would be zero. In such a case, we have the exponent being zero. e to the power of zero is one, such that we subtract 0 0.6 from 0 0.9 and end up with a value of 0.3. And this utility function will be upward sloping. Utility will increase with consumption. And to see this, have a look at the first derivative. U dot from CT is equal to, well, the constant is irrelevant, so we focus only on the second term. It's minus 0.6 times the derivative of the exponential function, and that is the function itself as you will recall for exponential functions, e to the power of minus ct over phi. But now we must multiply this with the interior derivative of the exponent. The derivative of minus ct over phi, that's minus 1 over phi. Now, we can adjust this conveniently here, but we have two minus signs and we can just take them off. Minus times minus is plus, so this is more convenient. And the exponential function by nature is larger than zero such that the whole term must be larger than zero. Okay. This implies the curve must be upward sloping. But how is it upward sloping? Is it convex or is it concave? To see this, we must have a look at the second derivative. So we are taking the derivative of the first derivative, which again is the point 0.6. I take the phi from here, put it here into the um, denominator. We multiply again with the same exponential function, e to the power of minus ct over phi, and must again multiply with the interior derivative, which again is minus 1 over phi. Now this time, you easily see all this is larger than 0, so the whole term is negative. And this tells you that the curve, uh, that the curvature is such that the slope is diminishing with larger CT. So altogether, we get something like, well, 
to tell you the truth, it can never be larger than 0.9. Let's assume 0.9 is up here and 0.6 is here. So the curve will be upward sloping and then the slope gets flatter and flatter. Now this concave curvature tells you something about risk aversion. Risk aversion. Because due to this concave function, people don't like extreme values. They prefer some medium values. So if we have the 100 here and the 200 here, rather than having 0 in one year and 200 in another year, they prefer to have 100 in both years. Because between 0 and 200, the mean of these will be somewhere here. But having 100 in each year would move them upward. Would, and this would improve, would increase their utility. We can determine a measure of the risk aversion that we have here in this function. And a common measurement is the ratio between the curvature and the slope. And that should be intuitive to you. If the curvature is very strong, so it quickly turns, it, uh, the, the slope quickly becomes flatter. In such a, an, an area, there is a high level of risk aversion. And we take this risk aversion relative to the slope. This supplies us with a good intuition on the level of risk aversion. So the measure is minus the second derivative at the level CT over the first derivative. Okay? So these are, this is our measurement of risk aversion. And we can determine this level here for a function because we just divide the second term by the first term. And you see all the things actually cancel out. The only thing that is left over is this interior derivative that we have here. So you can show that this is 1 over 5. You see, it is a constant. And because this is so, this particular utility function has a, has, has a word. It is a Kara utility function, a constant absolute risk aversion function due to this constant here. Now we can infer the consumption path that we get across time. And for this, path, we have one further assumption, and that is over time we get interest. Whatever we save, whatever we do not consume today, will earn interest and is thus more valuable tomorrow. So the real interest rate, the real interest rate let that be R, and let's assume for the moment this is 0.1, 10% per year. Now that's an extremely large value. And now we can determine the path by help of the Euler equation. Now since this is so important, let me write this in fat. Euler equation. And the Euler supplies you with, um, with a comparison of marginal utilities across time. Now, since my computer does no longer, okay, here we are back. My computer was just 
uh, in danger of uh, going down. So the Euler is a ratio between the marginal utility we have for consumption in round T, and this must somehow compare to the marginal utility we get in T plus 1. Now, since we get interest on whatever we do not consume today, it makes sense to postpone consumption, consume less today. And this is what we do if we have a higher marginal utility today, because less consumption means the slope is higher. So this term, then, should be higher than the one we have in the future. And the difference is just 1 plus r. So suppress consumption to a level that the marginal utility is higher, such that whatever you push to the future will earn there the additional interest rate, r, in addition to what you have pushed to the future, in addition to the 1, such that the marginal utility you get in the future can be lower because consumption then is higher and correspondingly marginal utility is lower. So once this appears intuitive to you, the rest actually follows mechanically because we just insert for the first derivative we have 0.6 times e to the power of minus ct over phi must be equal to 1 plus r times 0.6 times e to the power of minus ct over phi. And here it is ct plus 1 over phi. Now that looks complicated. And in order to deal with this, oh, I made an error. Have you spotted my error? I forgot about the, the phi here. So this is 0.6 over phi. And this is 0.6 over phi. Now, luckily, these are constants. And since they are on both sides of the equation, we can just erase them. Still, this looks a little complicated with these exponential functions. Now, what we do then is we take the logarithm on both sides. And the logarithm of this, well, basically, I just erase the logarithm once again, because the logarithm of the exponential function is just the exponent. So I can just write minus ct over phi, which must be equal to the logarithm of 1 plus r. Now, recall that the logarithm of a product is equal to the sum of the two logarithms. So I take the logarithm of the first part, and then I'm adding the logarithm to the second part. Now, again, the logarithm of this second part is just the exponent, minus ct plus 1 over phi. Okay, now what I do next is I multiply by minus phi and I bring this term over to the other side such that we get ct minus ct plus 1. And since I multiplied by minus phi, we then have minus phi ln of 1 plus r. That is our function. And in order to make this even easier to comprehend, observe that this term 1 plus r is pretty close to 1. And since it is close to 1, we can approximate this term just by the r. So this is close to minus phi r. The consequence is 
that we have a curve for consumption over time. Now this is my consumption level and this is time. And this level will somehow be, well, let's assume we have a level of 100 here. This curve will somehow be increasing. And it's increasing on a um, constant rate. So it's linear. Because from t to t plus 1, each time we're just adding phi r. In our particular case, the phi being 100 and the r being point 1 would be equal to 10. So here in our case, this is minus 10. So the current consumption is always 10 below future consumption. Now what we still have to think about is the restriction. Why can't we consume as much as uh, we like? Why can't we um, move this curve upward, for example, to this level? There must be some restriction that hinders us from doing so, and this restriction certainly is our income, is our life cycle income. Okay, to understand this, let's think about this restriction. We have consumption CT plus savings ST. The total amount of what we can um, allocate in round T is, well, we allocate into consumption and the rest is saved. And what we have available is our income, YT, plus the savings we had from the last round. And these savings are amplified by the real interest rate. And in fact, this is not just one restriction. This is in fact 10 restrictions. So if, if we have 10 rounds here, starting from 1 to 10, in each of these rounds, this restriction applies. And we can infer from this restriction the overall restriction that we face. And this goes as follows. In S10, no, not taking this one, this one's better. In S10, we should have zero because, well, the life is ending. There is no sense of leaving anything behind. So our rational subject does not care about other people, about uh, inheritance, for example. Now, knowing this, we can infer that C10 plus 0, so we leave this out, the 0, must be equal to Y10 plus 1 plus R times S9. So we can infer that savings in round 9 must be equal to C10 over 1 plus R minus Y10 over 1 plus R. I hope you see this that I just put over, moved the Y10 to the left-hand side and then divided by 1 plus R. Now knowing this, we can look at the next restriction, C9 plus S9, which is C10 over 1 plus R minus Y10 over 1 plus R must be equal to Y9 plus 1 over R S9. And now again, we would divide by 1 plus R to obtain an expression for 
S8. And you see that the 1 plus R in the denominator um, is then depicted to the power of 2. And we continue by backward induction, by going through all these restrictions to then observe that this 1 plus R obtains higher power across time. And in the end, the restriction that we get is, well, from t from 1 to 10, the total consumption divided by 1 plus r to the power of t minus 1 must be equal to the sum from t from 1 to 10 of income divided over 1 plus r to the power of t minus 1. So basically what you see is the only thing, the only restriction that we have is the current value of consumption must be equal to the current value in time t of future um, income. So that it's the two current values that must be equal. And the nice feature of this is that it does not matter when your income arises. If you get all your income just in round one and nothing thereafter, but if, if that is of the same present value, then you have the same consumption path. Likewise, if you get all your income just in round 10, then also if that has the same present value, it's the same consumption path. So much for today. Thank you for your attention.